Another problem arose with the filming of the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. The problem is quite simple. It can't be done. Even if you could get deep enough, it would be far too dark. So the Living Planet built its own Pacific seabed here in Britain, with materials imported directly from the real ocean floor and from the real mountains at the bottom of the real Pacific. Conjuring tricks seem less impressive when they're explained, and as you watch the camera swing through the mountains like a dentist's drill through rotten teeth, it looks a bit pointless until you see the actual film taken, as we will in a minute when we've added the music. This is made of Vale, once a roller skating rink and now the habitat of the BBC Radiophonic Workshop. Here they've also been wrestling with the problem of what nature sounds like, or rather should sound like, because much of the time it doesn't make a great deal of noise at all. So they've asked composer Elizabeth Parker to invent enough sound to go with 12 hours of nature. And they keep her locked up in one of these little cells. Liz Parker is what they call an electronic composer. I think this means she has to be plugged in before she can work. Liz, I find it very hard to believe that in this, what you call a music studio, there's actually enough resources to produce music for 12 programmes. I mean, I don't even see a mu musical instrument lying around. So what, what have you got here? Well, my most basic piece of equipment is a synthesizer. Um, and I've got three of those. So they provide the basis for the music. Um, I also have various devices through which I can manipulate sounds off the synthesizer, or natural sounds. Um, for example, har the harmonizer is one of them. Um, if we take a simple sound, like uh, just a sort of that sort of sound, if we put it through the harmonizer, which is sometimes called the fairy dust machine, in fact, you'll see why, because it's quite a pretty effect. Um, yeah. It's going a bit high. And then if we add a bit of flutter echo, that's a, another very simple way of manipulating the sound. Um, I've also got a vocoder, which is something that I can sing into and play at the same time. And the resulting sound is um, a combination of voice and instrumental sound, which I've used fairly extensively throughout the 12 programmes. Um, and a phase shifter, which um, if you can imagine the sound as a piece of ribbon, it kind of turns, turns the sound round and, and makes it move up and down. Um, no, I can't imagine that. <laughs> then, of course, apart from all that, I have all the natural sounds that I've used very extensively. The bottles? Um, even the bottles, yes. Um, what I do with those is to process them through a computer um, here. And the computer... Uh, puts them back onto the synthesizer as a natural sound. If I just um, call up this particular sound, um, there's it. Uh, well, that's actually got harmonizer on as well. Now that is actually the sound of a bottle, me blowing across a bottle. And you can see it becomes a musical instrument. And um, one can do the same with the bells, that bell up there. Um, one can do it with scratching mics. Um, paper, glass crashes, anything. So, so that actually adds enormously to your So you give the computer sound. one note and it can deduce all the other notes yes. that it can play? Yes. In this particular scene, we're going along the ocean bed and looking at these amazing mountains right at the bottom of the ocean. Music is trying to convey that feeling of mysteriousness and beauty and strangeness. Don't forget, viewers, this is the very same dusty studio floor we were looking at just now. So much for big effects, but what about music for tiny things? A particular example I can think of was the leafy sea dragon, which um, I actually used a couple of combs to create a sound on it. Um, it, it, it has little fins that waggle around while it's underwater, and although they don't as such make a noise, um, I created a sound for them using these two combs.
This is a weedy sea dragon. It's beautiful and it's amazing, but you didn't see it in the living planet. That's because they already have the even more picturesque leafy sea dragon, and apparently there's only room for one sea dragon in any nature film. And at this point, I'd like to pay my own personal tribute to the things that didn't make the big time. To the Potu, for example, which showed no desire at all to go into showbiz and looked like Frank Sinatra being asked to smile for the press. It even tried to bite the cameraman. To the lowly Lichin, which, although they speeded up the film, still wasn't glamorous enough at the auditions. To the Rocky Mountain Goat, which was filmed to show off its hairy protection against the snow, but was ruthlessly dropped from the production because there was no snow. The snow was all up in the Rocky Mountains. To the prairie chicken, which is adapted for running about on the green grassy prairie and was given the chop because there was far too much snow, so that it looked like a kind of Kentucky frozen chicken. I'd like to pay tribute to the ghost crab. The only thing it did wrong was to run away to sea and the only reason it did that is that it was being chased by a man with a camera. I feel sorry for the owls in the Arizona cactus. They weren't allowed into the desert sequence because that was switched to the Middle East and there are no cacti there, so no owls. I feel sorry above all for the most beautiful butterfly taking off in slow motion, dropped because the cameraman hadn't focused the camera. Nobody ever drops the cameraman, of course. They keep everything he does. The cameraman is afraid of only one life form in nature, the editors. The pack leader of the editors is Andrew Naylor. Andrew, you've been sitting for two and a half years now, locked away in this small cutting room in Bristol while the cameraman are having a great time abroad and sending back their film to you, which is all up there, I notice, about 100 hours worth? Yes, even more than that. Well, the thing that surprises me is that old film you're not using, mm -hmm. which suggests that you're looking for something that's not always there. What are you actually looking for as an editor? Well, unlike drama filming, where the shots um, are tailor-made to fit a script, animals can't read a script. So I rely heavily on the cameraman give me enough coverage of an animal, perhaps 25 times as much film as I need, in order that I can find shots in there that will cut together to produce a nice, smooth flow. Well, sometimes you must find that they just haven't done the stuff. I mean, you can't send them back to the rainforest to do it again. Uh, what do you do then? Well, sometimes they have problems, and uh, that's what makes my job more interesting, really, sorting out those problems. Uh, we do have ways of doing that. Um, so that, unlike the cameraman's job, where his results are shown on the screen, uh, you shouldn't really see what I've done. I hope you appreciate it at the end, but the results should be nice and smooth and easy to watch. Well, I suppose I ought to ask you what strange bit of nature you've got up on the screen <coughs> today. You might recognise this one. 